And now we have the world of the story, Kom Toibin, Nilanjana Roy, Philip Henshaw, and Amitava Roy, Amitava Kumar, will be in conversation with Mukund Padmanabhan. To say it's, uh, it's a privilege for me to, to be here moderating the session with four extremely accomplished authors. Uh, when the invitation was made, I was anxious about a couple of things. The first, of course, was a practical issue of fitting four voices in 50 minutes, and then it's something that we need to do. The second and more confounding thing was to try and think up of some unifying thread, some common idea uh, that runs through the writing of this extremely diverse panel. Uh, not necessarily a, a single precise feature, but something like uh, you know, what Wittgenstein called a family resemblance, a loose association uh, sort of related thread. And honestly, I didn't get very far with this. Uh, you know, yes, Nilanjana has written a book on cats. Uh, Amitabh has written a book called A Matter of Rats. But that's not, <laughs> doesn't form the basis of a good discussion. Um, but when the organizers came through with the title of the discussion, The World of the Story, and the possible talking points around it, uh, it just becomes clear that the diversity of this panel, made up of writers who reside in different countries, have grappled with different subjects, have distinctive styles, is a really good thing. And it holds out the possibility of getting different, even contrasting views, which in invariably make for a stimulating session. So we just get down to it right away. Um, and if I may, I'll start with Com, um, with a question related directly to the title of the discussion, The World of the Story. You don't like the expression storyteller, uh, and you suggest the inspiration for your fiction doesn't come from the oral storytelling tr tradition at all, but from uh, born from silences. Can you expand on this? Um, the phrase storyteller is often used about writers to suggest that somehow your, your inspiration is, is effectively naive and, and that it comes from some oral tradition. You know, in other words, that if you're Irish, somehow you must have had an old grandmother sitting in the corner who had thousands of stories left over from thousands of years and um, that everything ever happened in Ireland she remembered and she knew ancient Greek, you know, and that she could just talk and talk and talk and you were the little boy listening. And, um, you know, it's, people often say, I, I mean, it's, it's a particular, I mean, saving your presence, uh, and, and Philip, you know, that it's something that often comes from what we would call the other island in the archipelago, you know, England, where people would say, oh, you Irish are so marvelous, you're all natural storytellers. And you think, oh, God, natural. So it comes from, you know, it isn't like even a talent. It's just we're all storytellers. Just I happen to be the one here. Hello. And... Um, that it just pours out of you, you know, it's, it's a sort of, you know, it, it's the opposite to drink, you know, drink pours into you. And uh, I just began to notice it, it being said, oh, all of you, all of you Irish. And I started to think about home, and I started to think, you know, mostly people said nothing. You know, I had an uncle who, I don't think he spoke at all in his life. He would often say, turn down the television, or, or he would say, close the door or that match on Sunday, there was a good goal, that second goal was better than the first goal. And then he would nod his head, and if, well, you could try and make that into a story, but I don't know how you would do that. It had neither a beginning or middle or an end. And so, um, the, I, mean, I mean, I'm interested in the idea, especially of, of the short story, as, as, as quite a highly wrought form. I, I, mean, I mean, one that can include a multitude, it, it, it can seem, filled with orality. It can seem to have a source, you know, also in, at its most extreme, you know, in what the author has been reading rather than what the author has been experiencing. In other words, it's a very open form. It's very hard to, to pin down. But I, just to say that um, I, I, I think I'm a sort of literary novelist who happens to have written two books of stories that took a lot out of me, that I revised a lot, and that come out of silence as much as out of speech, and that come out of a literary heritage as much as they do from anything natural. And so, I, I mean, I probably would, you know, I, I could tell you a story, but it wouldn't be any good. But uh, I could write a story maybe, and I could try and revise it and see if I could make it better. Uh, Philip, I'm going to ask you uh, the same question, but with, in a slightly different way. I mean. Change is, seems to be the only constant in your astonishingly diverse body of work. You've had um, 
the linearity and the sort of unflinching realism in the, the Northern Clemency, and then you've done your last book, The Emperor Waltz, which is, you know, you play with form, you take liberties with chronology, three different narratives. Um, you have a novel set in faraway places, uh, first Afghan war, uh, Mulberry Empire, uh, you've written a libretto. Uh, are you constantly challenging yourself, not merely to relate different stories, but also to relate them very differently? Well, I think that um, um, sometimes when, when people ask me this question, they, um, they imagine that I have a, a, a file of possible subjects um, in front of me that uh, I'm going to choose one. Um, out of three, say, and, you know, as, as though it's some kind of conscious decision, but it's not really like that. In fact, I often think it's more um, a question of, um, of not wanting to, to write a novel, and certainly with the... I mean, this is very typical. My, my novel about the, uh, the First Afghan War, the Mulberry Empire, I couldn't understand why I was so interested by the First Afghan War. This was in the mid-1990s, when very, very few people were paying much attention to um, Afghanistan. And I kept thinking, oh, somebody ought to write a novel about this. And I've, I've, never, I've, never, I've never written a historical novel. I had no intention of writing a historical novel. And in fact, I don't really like historical novels. Um, so, um, so it came as a great surprise to me when I kept thinking, somebody ought to write a historical novel about uh, the first Afghan war, and then um, if I ever wrote a novel about, and then I could say, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. And then, well, if I, if I did, there would be this episode in it, and there would be a bit about, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to try it. And this went on for about three years, and finally it was actually more effort not to write the novel than just to say, oh, very well, and just get on and, and do it. So those, they kind of force themselves on you, and once they're there you have to work out the best way to let these people tell their own story. For me, it's all a matter of hearing the, the voice, not just of the people in the novel, but of the, the novel itself. For, for me, a novel always makes a particular sound. It, it kind of makes a particular music. And... It's a very, it's a very difficult thing to to describe, but um, um, I know that um, that very often, um, as I'm getting towards the end of a of a novel, I can actually hear the sound of the last few pages. I can hear exactly the kind of music that's going to that, that's going to 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 emerge. Sometimes before I know what's actually going to happen in in those pages, and you just have to fill the sound of that with actually something that, that makes sense. It's a, it's, it's a very difficult thing talking about how you write a, no, uh, write a novel because you always, always sound insane. <laughs> uh, Nalanjana, uh, Wildings is about a fantasy about cats and other animals. Uh, doesn't all fantasy come from a tradition of oral storytelling or...? I see what you're trying to do out here. I'm asking the same question <laughs> in different ways. <laughs> but uh, actually, yeah. it's, uh, when I was, um, I turned 35, I made a promise to myself. I'd been reading uh, a lot of books that fell into the gap. They were ambitious, but they were mediocre, and they were very self-consciously literary. And I didn't want to have anything to do with those again. And I said, I will never, ever write a book myself. And then um, a few years later, uh, two things happened that were very unusual for me. Um, I don't deal well with sadness as an emotion. I can write out of anger, I can write very well out of curiosity, but sadness uh, quicksands me. And I went through a period of unaccustomed um, personal sadness where for a while I had the same dream every night. It felt uh, as though I was in a large house and somebody whom I couldn't see came in and turned off the lights. And I, every night, I hoped that one light would be left on. And every night, it was turned off. And this continued for months. And I think it was affecting my work a little bit as well. I was writing on gender for the New York Times at uh, that time. And I hadn't realized how rich that was because um, you were involved with the lives of women and they were opening up their stories to you, which is a very precious 
thing to happen. But it was also grim and there was one holiday that I took with my partner to the hills. We were driving through Uttar Pradesh and uh, we were coming back via Haryana. And along the way I was chatting happily about how this is where the honor killings happened in Jin, then this is where the bodies of the women were found near the canal. And uh, that place out there, that little town opposite Rewari, that was where you had the first uh, accidental finding of female fetuses. And after about half an hour, 45 minutes of this, my partner, who is a very kind man, and did not say what was on his mind, turned to me and he said, are you enjoying your work? And I sat back and thought about it and I said, okay, I have to find a way to recover my sense of um, gladness. And I tried to write short stories before, they were realist and grim, and I always slid off the surface of them like black eyes. And uh, the only thing I wanted to write about at that point was Delhi. I could not write about humans, but cats came into view. And uh, their world was as grim in some ways and as violent as ours, but there was a welcoming lightness. Uh, you can't follow cats around a neighborhood and you can't follow cheels around. Cheels are the kites yeah. in the sky. Mm -hmm. Or watch a colony of pigs for an afternoon without at some level laughing, you know. They live in this grim world where they're rooting in rubbish dumps and uh, you have three-legged cats because one of their legs was damaged by fireworks or something. And they are so incredibly happy. And that joy comes out of something um, that we don't acknowledge, which is that they have a relationship with each other and with the city. And as I started to write that, I think I recovered who I'd been before this fog descended. So it's strange, you know, because you think of fantasy as something lighthearted and that's what it's meant to be. But I really think that I wrote for survival. I didn't realize it at the time. It's only something that comes up in retrospect. But I'm so glad I did. Yeah, so, so is anyone, I'm sure, who's read your novel. Yeah. Uh, I mean, much as your work has been uh, in the genre of creative or sort of narrative non-fiction, um, what do you see as the main advantage of bringing uh, sort of literary and fictional techniques into, into your work, which is quite evident from, you know, reading most of your essays? Yeah. First of all, that session on sex mm. was so prolonged there should have been a little break in between because I thought after all that talk about sex, I needed a cigarette. Mm. You know, so um, I'm speaking without having that cigarette. All right. Uh, there's, a, there's a line in uh, The Master where uh, Goss comes to visit Henry James and he thinks, he's complaining and there's a line like, once he was, um, there's a line like, uh, once he was distracted from, though that's not the right word, once he was distracted from thinking about the real, uh, about fiction as a raid on the real, as a cheap raid on the real, he then turned his mind to something else and began, I am interested in narrative non-fiction in the raid on the real. In other words, how does one in some ways whether it is in non-fiction, but also I would say in fiction, how does one draw upon what surrounds you, what you find in newspapers, what's happening in your own life, what you hear the neighbors saying, and producing in an innovative genre, something that is meshed together in order to produce a statement. Now, when, I don't know whether David is here, David Davidar, but when he called me to say, I'm doing a series on cities right about Patna. Patna. Mm. The first thing I thought of was, well, rats. rats carried away my mother's dentures. So, that's the first thing. But then what do you surround it with, right? So then I thought of the memory, the memory of people who were Musahars in my village who were, you know, then whose name means rat eaters. And I thought, okay. I'll talk to them. And then I thought, you know, Jitan Ram Manji, who later became the CM of Bihar, had said, I have eaten rats through my childhood. I didn't die. Why shouldn't rats in a protein-starved state, rats that are, you know, that are field rats, why shouldn't they be served in restaurants? And all the upper castes were up in arms against that. So I thought, it is the raid, the, you know, the raid on the real, in the sense of making something 
that is a complex mix of those things in order to make a statement. Finding a pattern and then producing a statement about the society in which you're living. So that's what I'm trying to do in narrative nonfiction. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's also a lot of uh, involves, a lot of meeting people, a lot of uh, reporting off the ground. Does, does anyone want to come in on this, uh, Philip? Well, I think that um, the, the sense of the, the real in, in fiction, at any rate, that sense of uh, recognition that we all have, yes, that's exactly right, that must have happened. Um, there's, there's no way that this isn't um, a, a, an event from the outside world. Often it's uh, an ingenious um, um, artistic um, effect, really. And the, uh, the effect of a truthful statement in prose is not really constrained by whether it really is true or not. Um, I, think that, uh, I think the sense of, of the truthful is... Um, um, is a wonderful one to come across um, in um, in fiction, but you know I teach it. Um, I teach creative writing at Bath Spa, and um, uh, very often I I get work from students, and they say, "But this really happened," and I say, "Well, you're telling me this, but it's utterly, utterly unconvincing." Yes. You know, the um, the utterly convincing fact is. Um, um, is uh, Flaubert saying that uh, he wanted to write Madame Bovary after he thought of a woman in uh, a dress the colour of a woodlouse? No. Now, that's uh, just out of uh, Flaubert's head. That never happened. There was no such woman. But it has the ring of, uh, of truth. And I think that's what we ought to be aiming at, the appearance of truth and not really be worrying about whether it really is true. But, you know... Uh doesn't fiction have this capacity as well to go beyond the empirical, uncover truths that non-fiction cannot, I mean, you know, understand the complexities in, of relationships, uh, you know, in our societies, in our, in our lives. I mean, you know, Ra Ralph Waldo Emerson was famously quoted as saying, fiction reveals truths that non-fiction cannot. Is that the view you subscribe to, both of you? Yes, there's certainly, there's certainly a way in which when we're reading um, when, when we're reading the, uh, the Lord of the Rings, we, we get uh, three quarters of the way through it, we say, yes, that's exactly what a wizard would say to a Balrog. You know, there's, there's a sort of truthful, truthfulness in there which uh, has nothing to do with... with which yes, has got to do create, with recognition in a way. Yes, oh. it can create its own sense of, uh, of recognition, it can cre create its own sense of truthfulness within a creative world, which we don't really have to refer to reality to discover. Cool. Um, I think it came up in, at the very beginning of Henry James's career as a writer, where he talked, um, he was writing in the middle, in the white heat of the American Civil War, and he doesn't apologize, he just merely says that I really need to work from the reverse side of the picture. And, and I'm interested in that idea, that while something public and fierce is going on in the newspapers and on television news, that you, the writer, are watching for the blurred figure in the side for something that nobody, someone that no one's going to interview because in the press it wouldn't work. And I want to give you an example of this, that in Ireland, we've had a huge controversy over the last decade or 15 years over child sex abuse, especially by priests. And um, I was watching this very carefully and I was writing about it, um, you know, uh, um, as a journalist. And, and then it struck me that there was a story not being told. You know, while there were many, many interviews uh, in these years with victims of abuse, and you know, we saw the court cases, we read the evidence, it suddenly occurred to me what it would be like in a town like the town I'm from, which is a small town, if somebody who was very proud almost of having a son a priest, and everything was going really well, and then no one could tell her the news, your son, the priest, is, there's going to be a court case. He is accused of being an abuser. And I thought that this would not work. You know, a journalist would, not, would find this interview almost impossible to do. You know, that the people would not... First of all, the people just wouldn't be interviewed. But secondly, you couldn't get the sense of silence surrounding this, of shame, of what it might be like when this old woman who's 80 years old in a town, they have to tell her. And I think what happens now is, uh, when you're talking about this idea of how hard it is to describe, that you think of that, but that's only an idea. 
I mean, you, could, you know, a thousand people could think of it. And then, how would you do that? And the only, there's only one way, really, which is that something like that, an idea, an, a set of ironies, something that isn't being said, lodges in one side of the brain and stays there, as information does. And on its own, of its own accord, at a certain moment, it will become rhythm. It will move from being information to being sound, almost. And you find yourself, when you least expect it, getting the, the opening of it, as though it's a melody, almost like a song. In other words, I had this idea for ages. And then at one point, just with a scrap of paper, you know, a, a stray scrap of paper that I had in my pocket, I said, the first sentence came. And I could work then, once I had the sound, you know, the idea was almost no use. The idea was almost not even a beginning. The idea was just may maybe some raw material required, but, but then a chemical was needed to get the raw material to actually begin to live. And to live as though, as you say, it were fact, or, or it, has, it had the lovely feel of fact. This must have happened. Or at least for these pages, I'm going to turn the page because I need to know what did she say next. And of course, what you can do in fiction is, she didn't say anything. In other words, I have the, the son, who's the priest, the abuser, finally coming to see his mother. And I thought, oh, if this was a Brazilian soap opera, I know they would be shouting and screaming. If this was a newspaper report, they would have to, oh, she was very angry. She... But in a story, you can have nothing. She sort of looked at him. She made tea for herself. You know, she forgot the butter in the fridge. She went to get the butter. He opened the newspaper and read it. You know, a set of nothings begins to lift from its own occasion to being a near, nearly communication, nearly the sort of poetry of something that doesn't happen. So in a story, you can keep working with something that almost doesn't happen. Stories, I mean, short stories work particularly well with disappointment, with the person that didn't arrive, with the person you know, that didn't go to Buenos Aires on that boat. With the, with, the, with the end of James Joyce's The Dead, where, you know, she didn't want to sleep with him, actually. And she fell asleep, you know. And uh, so that, that, that sort of work, I think, can happen in fiction. And maybe it can happen in short fiction, in a way that the novel requires history, background, destiny, choice, chance, you know, big things must, at some point, money. But whereas in a short story, you can just have one small thing almost happening, and then, for a second, silence, and then it doesn't happen, and then you have to sort of bring the story down to an end. So, so, yeah, sure. I agree. Uh, yeah, so Amitav, I, uh, so the meaning and significance sometimes lie in the gaps, lie in the silences. Uh, is this some, uh, you know, I, I want to say, is this something that, uh, you know, maybe you can address that uh, in your own way, but is it something you think that is a, yeah, I know Colm Stiles, right? His fiction is, is sparse, pared down to the bone. Uh, you get the sense that, um, uh, you know, what is significant lies uh, not, not merely in the arrangement of sentences, but what is in between them or, or beyond them in a way. Uh, but the question is, is that, is that just some people's writing or is it part of the very project of fiction? So. Well, I want to say that I read that story that Colm is talking about. It's a very powerful story. And there was a sense very clearly that something that had not been attended to before was being given voice. But here, having heard what Philip and Colm have said about fiction and agreeing with them, I do want to, for a brief moment, wave the banner of non-fiction. And this is why. After the, after, after the December 16 rape in Delhi that received worldwide attention, the report, a year later, uh, for The Guardian, I think, or the BBC, the BBC, Sautik Biswas did an interview. The father of the girl said that when he got the call and arrived at the hospital and saw the state in which his daughter was, his first thought was, how will I have the money to take the body back? And he said, this is what poverty does to you. This is Nirbhaya. Nirbhaya's uh, father, Jyoti Singh's father said, this is what poverty does to you. 
And then, at the next anniversary of her death, another news report said whether journalist went looking for the juvenile offender's family, the younger brother said, if I had chappals, which are slippers, flip-flop, if I had chappals, I too would have left my village. What I see in this is what non-fiction delivers a certain sense of reality, whether it is grim or not remains, you know, uh, is, is open to contention, a certain sense of reality that sometimes my imagination cannot conjure. So to run up against and discover the reality of the world in a gritty sense, which journalism does or non-fiction does, and to give it narrative form is something that also I would like to celebrate. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Sure. Can, I think that um, we're, we're talking about the difference between you know, good writing and, and not good writing. And a not, and the writer who isn't good will, will turn up and say, um, how did you feel when you discovered your daughter was, was dead? And the, the respondent will say, I, I felt devastated, and that's, a, that's an end to it. I always think of um, a terrifying story I heard once about the 19th century French actress, Rachel, and she had a most beloved sister. She was the only, she was the only relation that she had in the world. And one day, um, her sister was, um, the, the news that her sister had been killed in a carriage accident uh, had to be brought to Rachel. And she heard the news standing and, um, and collapsed. It was the worst thing that could ever have happened to her. And when she came round, the first thing that she said was, tell me, did I raise my hand to my forehead as I fell? She wanted to know, even at that moment, what do people do physically? And I think that uh, for the, the novelist, that sense of keeping your eyes open to see what people really do at the extremity of behavior is a real duty. And that's true for the writer of nonfiction as well. Yeah, but I just want to, you know, um, just ref, you know, take what you said and refer to Nilanjana because uh, isn't there a substratum of this, of the real in, in fantasy as well? Uh, I mean, your book, for instance, uh, uh, you know, Nizamuddin comes alive in a, in a very real way, even though the book is, is, is a fantasy. Uh, must we always expect some kind of realism from good writing, even if it's fantasy, is it? I'm not a fan of realism uh, if it's practiced the wrong way, because real life also includes the boring bits, and I'm, I'm not that fond of boring bits. But what I like about fantasy is simply that it takes the other part of your pact as a writer. You know, one part of you wants to pay tribute to what is real, what is happening. That's the kind of thing that I address, for example, with the essays. I've just finished a collection of essays on reading. And I thought they were going to be about writers, and I thought they were going to be about books. But they ended up about being why you love books so much, why anybody would sit down and go through other people's voices and stories. And of course, the answer to that is that you want to share in other people's lives and experiences that you can't have. So that's where the real part of it comes from. But the lure of fantasy for me comes from the Ursula K. Le Guin side of things, which is you were given an imagination partly so that you could stretch it to the maximum. And uh, part of the fun of it is the one part where you and the realist writer meets is in the way a story starts out. You're making something from nothing. You know, you just have an image or something tactile, the brush of what a cat's fur feels like before it is wounded and how it warms up afterwards, you know, after she's been in the first big fight of her life on the steps of an old uh, abandoned stepwell in Delhi where she is shivering and she's scared and she's taking on a tomcat that's about four times her size. And for a long time, that image walks around in your head with nowhere to go. Because you're saying, of course people don't write about cats. And then you read a little bit more of Ursula K. Le Guin, or you read Terry Pratchett, and you realize that people can write about anything, anything at all that they imagine. But the only thing about an imagined world, and this is something you discover when you're actually world building, 
it has to have real bricks and straw in it, you know. If you say that your world has two suns, well, what are they doing to the climate, you know? How do people deal with that? There has to be a measure of reality in everything and the more fantastic your world gets, the more real it has to be. There's a lot of, um, I think for all of us, it doesn't matter whether you're writing as a short story writer or whether, like Amitav, you're flipping between, you know, and like you, you know, you're flipping between being a non-fiction or a fiction writer. At some point, what you're trying to do is to take these, you know, poor, sad bones of an idea that you have, and you're trying to put some flesh and blood on them. So I was, I was so nervous when, about the silliest of things when I wrote The Wildlings. I didn't really care what humans thought about it. I, I hope they would like it. But I was really afraid that a hypothetical cat would somehow learn to read and would read it and say, <laughs> no, that's not the way cats think. <laughs> And so to get over that fear, you know, I did very much what a fiction or a non-fiction writer would do, which is I studied cat behavior and then I got fascinated by whiskers. And I realized that there's this whole world of rats and cats communicating through whiskers. And then suddenly, from a writer, you become a translator. Because you can't just say his whiskers quivered and a lot of emotion was conveyed in that quivering. You know, people will go to sleep. So you end up being, uh, as a fantasy writer, the trick that you pull off is to try to create a world that feels real. So if people recognize something like Nizamuddin, ah yes, the dargah is there and the buildings and yeah. the mud is the same mud that we remember from when we went there last Friday, then they forget that they're actually reading about cats who don't exist and that you made up in the privacy of your own mind. So, um she used the expression, um, uh, she said somewhere that, she, that realism uh, is boring. Um, do you, uh, if, that, if that is used, say, off, uh, in a review of one of your books, would you regard that as uh, something that's slightly uncomplimentary, or oh, both of you, Philip, uh, call him? Uh, uh, bor she, said, she said she finds realism boring. Um, and, uh, oh. Uh, suppose somebody described the Northern Clemency. I mean, I did. I think it's a realist work. Uh, I, I said it the, depends on yeah, how I, it's I done. I understand the context, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I always think of, um, you know, W. H. Jordan's... I'm uh, not so trying to start a fight or anything, no, no, I promise. No, no, <laughs> no, I know. It's, um, I, um, I always think of W. H. Jordan's uh, sonnet about the novelist, where he says that the novelist has to become the whole of boredom. He says that poets can um, dash forward like hussars, you know, you can write a poem in a morning, but you, as a, as a novelist, you have to enter into the, um, the detail of, of people's lives and trust your reader to, to, to follow you. Um, and uh, I think this is um, one of the reasons, if I can do the unaccustomed thing and compliment one of my fellow panelists. This is one of the reasons that I found um, Colm's no, new novel, Nora Webster, so extraordinarily moving, that it was, it, uh, it just enters into a life, a year of somebody's life where an enormous but slow, slow change is happening. And I think that um, I, I can't imagine anyone finding, finding it boring because just everything in it is is interesting and everything in it is, um, is valued. Um, on the question of, of boredom, I do think that we are a bit, um, bit ready to dismiss things as, as, um, as boring. And I do think um, um, boring is a, boredom is a, is a kind of vulnerable and rather kind of tender state in which um, all sorts of um, interesting things can um, can happen to the mind, um, and I, I, as a child, I, I, I loathed staring out of windows with with nothing happening and watching somebody sweep up the sweep uh, in the street outside. But um, but now I rather value those moments. I do think um, they were they're important. Now I, I love nothing better than just sitting doing nothing and staring into space. I'm going to stick up for boredom, actually. Um, but I don't think you mean that fiction, that, you know, that, that when you're choosing details, 
which is effectively what you're doing, that a novel is a thousand or two thousand details. Just be sure those details are of some interest and that you're building up a picture slowly and you're choosing them, sifting them, distilling them and then erasing some of them and working it back to say, is, am I actually communicating the emotion here with these details, with these rhythms? And, and, if, and therefore, I have to become my own reader and my own perhaps most suspicious reader, my own critic, before I can do anything, before I can really proceed, because it's constant business of saying, no, no, that actually might seem relevant, but it won't work here because I need to move on quick or I need to slow this down so much now, I've won the reader over by a, a maybe a rich detail. Now I have a few moments, maybe three paragraphs, to say something slow, to give how the mind works in its slowness, in its dartingness, in the way it shifts from one thing to another, how memory works, say, how desire works, how noticing works. And you get some chances then to proceed on the basis having won the reader. So you're constantly involved in a game in a way with the reader just to see how much will the reader take of this slow business of being uh, and then how much will the reader now need you to move on a bit faster, to vary the rhythm, slow it down. So, so, it's, so it's almost, I mean, you're, you're st I, mean, I, I mean, I know that you know, uh, that you know a lot about music. I mean, I often, you know, technically you know this business of what you must do at certain points. If you're writing a string quartet, you have to bring in the cello now, but don't overdo it now. And then the plaintiff must, you know, and if you have a slow movement, please, after the slow movement, give us a fast movement. You know, and, and in a way you're working all the time with those sort of ideas. First of all, intuitively. I mean, you have to really know this. In, you, know, you have to trust yourself and believe in, in, in your own processes. Uh, so it's a constant business of releasing energy and restraining energy. And um, that, that if you do too much of one or two or too little, that you then lose the reader by thinking this is, and, and it's not, I think the word boring is, I, I think it might become a moral issue that, that perhaps boring people is fundamentally immoral. You know, I mean, I mean, I know that killing is wrong and stealing is really wrong, but I wonder if this business of, you know, if, if, if you went out for a coffee with someone and they really bored you badly, I think you could have a right to feel that there was something quite wrong with them. I mean, not just that they were boring, but they were, Im they were immoral in some fundamental way, that their moral being was impaired in some way or other, and so too with the writer. What I have to say in response to that is you should have allowed me to expand on this. But uh, you know Umberto Eco's uh, definition of the difference between porn and erotic fiction? No. He says porn follows everything. A character gets onto a bus and you take the long, sad, dreary bus ride with him until he walks into a house and then they show you the bed cover and then so on and so forth. And that was his objection to porn, that it was, it was poor narrative. Whereas erotica cuts to the cheese and it does so by the novelist's selection of the right detail. Right. That to me is the difference between realist fiction that is boring and uh, it isn't represented on this stage, fortunately, yeah. but there is a lot of it that is done that is precisely. Yeah. Okay. That is done precisely like bad porn. Every part of somebody's life is shoved into this overstuffed suitcase that you actually don't want to open as the reader. But when it's done well, it's almost as good as fantasy. Okay. <laughs> uh, Amitabh, uh, coming to you. Uh, in India, this debate about you know, whether it's realism, fictional truth, is uh, when it's, it's invariably tied up with this question of authenticity when it comes to Indian writing in English. Um, and there are two kinds of issues. One is, you know, the challenge is people say that, you know, you're writing in a foreign language, you're just incapable of throwing real right on society, it's kinship patterns, it's say, caste relations, it's religious beliefs. Uh, because somehow these ideas are, can be, are born and can be only understood in, in your language. You know, Wittgenstein said, the limits to my language are the limits to the world, something like that. The other thing is, uh, oh, you guys, you English writers in India, you're all upper class, you're westernized, you're, you're sort of removed from 
Uh, you know, you don't understand the beating heart of India. Um, I think you'll recall that uh, uh, Vikram Chandra wrote this, this piece in response to a critic uh, which basically urged uh, people to say, you know, just get on with it, just write, just, you know, go with your heart. This is just a, a completely false debate. Uh, what's your stand? Where do you stand on this? Um, I don't know how many people have read that essay. It was called The Cult of Authenticity, Authenticity yeah. by Vikram Chandra. And I tried to argue that one shouldn't be tied up with this notion of authenticity too much. But I always thought it was a strident call or claim to authenticity itself, the, the article in itself. So that was an odd paradox. I often feel bored by the debate about authenticity, but I'm also fascinated by it. Or I, I always want to hear, you know what Philip was saying earlier, the authentic voice, a certain sound that doesn't try to claim moral high ground or righteousness, or is, but has a certain feel to it that makes you, that sounds convincing, as you were saying. Uh, since Colm is on stage with me, I want to read a paragraph from Rats, which says what I was trying to do in terms of authenticity. I thought one should be honest. But what would it mean to be honest when you were writing about your hometown? Well, it would mean in some ways betraying your friends. And so I want to pay you tribute, my friend, about how you legitimated that exercise of betrayal. All right? <laughs> I recently read an interview with the Irish writer called Turbin. Turbin had told a class he was teaching that, quote, you have to be a terrible monster to write, unquote. <laughs> Everything is material, the writer was saying even confidences that someone has indiscreetly shared with you. Tobin's advice to writers was to go ahead and use the story, even if readers were going to identify the person you were writing about. The writer's credo must be, use it, because it will make a great story. Tobin had said, again I quote, if you, can't do, if you can't do it, then writing isn't for you. You have no right to be here. If there's any way I can help you get into law school, then I will your morality will be more useful in a courtroom. So, for me, authenticity was, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice, we should applaud that, yes. For me, authenticity was being honest enough to, be, you know, to in some ways betray the confidences of some folks. And I'm not, you know, claiming to be the right person, but at least I thought I was doing my job as a writer. If I could write about, let's say, a radical poet's marriage in my hometown, which in its messiness said something about life and Patna. Even though the poet, of course, decided not to talk to me again, and I don't blame him. Nilanjana, any thoughts on Indian writing and authenticity, Vikram Chandra, critics, language? Life. Life. Yeah. Uh, well, I think uh, I changed my mind a lot about the authenticity debate when I realized that we'd been having it from the 18th century onwards, you know, pretty much from the time that Indian writing uh, embraced English as one of its own. And uh, so it's a 300 year old argument, that's the first thing that we need to recognize. Another way of seeing it, and I started to see this when I was looking at some of the pioneers of Indian writing. Um, the, the earliest was a man called Deen Muhammad who went to England after writing about, from Bihar, from Patna, uh, after writing about India for a foreign audience. So he was, you know, doing, committing the great sin in the book and all of that. But around Dean Muhammad, there were also these, uh, this entire generation of newspaper proprietors who were bilingual and sometimes trilingual, whom we'd never actually been taught to uh, read in school. And at some point you realize that one way of looking at it is just to see English as the youngest of the Indian languages, you know. We've already sneaked a lot of words into it, bungalow and calico and this, that and the other. And uh, our problem is really just how to be ourselves in English. It's not uh, how to be authentic because you're writing in English. But it's how do, you, how do you be true to your best self as a writer anyway? And I think that's pretty much a universal condition. I am interested that it keeps coming up again as a debate because I think in different centuries and different decades, it reveals a different kind of anxiety. There was one that we share with the Irish, which is, uh, are we imitating the people from the other island too greatly, you know? 
And then we got rid of that and now the question is, are we being untrue to our best selves? We want to be global and that's English. But can't it be an Indian English, which is where your Indian bestseller writers come out of? Uh, Philip, did you? Uh, yeah, go ahead. But I just want to ask you a question. Okay. Uh, maybe you so can you, add that into your response. Can um, I just, just say that yeah, yeah, okay. this this whole this whole question from the, an English English British English point of view seems very very strange because um, we haven't laid claim to English as our possession for centuries, probably. I mean, it's. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a global language. We might have a particular historical relationship to it because it emerged in this particular scrap of, of land, but it's, you know, it's, been, it's been other people's language for decades. The question of, of authenticity, um, I, I think I, I should say, I, I don't mean authenticity in anything, but a, a, an artistic quality. I don't mean that people should, um, should present their CVs and say, I am I'm now allowed to write in a particular language. I understand the, um, the, the, the way that um, some, um, some writers in, um, in Indian languages feel about the, the, the predominance of Indian, uh, Indian writing in, in English. And uh, you know, I, have, um, I have in-laws in, um, in Bangladesh who talk about um, Indian writers in English as of those who've diverged from the mainstream, um, but um, but I do think that um, you know even to debate this is talking about a stable door that's that's long long been left open. Surely, oh, when you wrote old. scenes from an early life and you have hmm. the Bangladeshi bits, did did yes. you have anyone in Bangladesh telling you? Um, any critic at all, any hostile critic saying, what does he know about Bangladesh? Why is he writing about stories about this? No. Well, um, um, did you have anything? I didn't story? want to take possession of the, of the stories. And in fact, um, all I really wanted to do was to draw the attention of a largely ignorant uh, British and American readership to one of the um, most uh, savage historical tragedies of the 20th century. Um, I wanted really, for, the, for anyone who read this book and said, my God, you know, to go away and read John R. A. Imam's diary, to read um, all sorts of uh, books by people who lived through it. Um, but um, you, I mean, the, I, I just felt that this was a book that needed to be that needed to be written, and it was the book that I had to write next. And afterwards, all those questions about authenticity: Did I have the right to do it? Should I have done it? Should I have shrugged my shoulders and said? Um, this is cultural appropriation. Um, I don't know. Everyone who is in the book, um, as far as I know, who has read it, um, appreciated it greatly and, um, and, and enjoyed it. They would have written a slightly different book. Um, I just want to take up a point you made about the stable door being closed or open. The, yes, but which way? You, you know, I think it's very, very easy if you're, if you're Irish or if you're from a country that isn't England to claim that you really are the victim of language, that you somehow England, the English came to us in Ireland with an army. It was imposed on us. It's in James Joyce's portrait of the artist, you know, that English is yours before it's mine. But I think that's to really miss the whole point of language, which is that language comes before, language itself, you know, it's the whole idea of having words, comes before any notion of its political origin or of what it actually means politically, or you know, whether it comes from a country that you're in some way you know, in conflict with. And, and certainly when, you know, in, in the, um, my grandfather and my uncle, certainly they had, they had a real difficulty with, with England as a state, as a government, but they certainly didn't stretch that to Shakespeare or Charles Dickens. I mean, they took the, those writers as theirs, as fundamentally belonging to them. And so that, that whole idea of what has happened with English, that, that, that it has in a way been a gift, because any language is a gift. You know, and writing in it, for me, it, I think, is as natural an act. You know, it, I mean, it may, there, there may be people who would tell me it's a cultural act for me to write in English, but actually it seems to me natural when I do it. I, you know, a door remains a door, whether it's open or whether with a stable door, it's a stable door. I, I will write the word stable door with the same confidence and freedom as you will, 
whether it's open or closed. I mean, we might differ on whether it's open or closed, but the words we use belong to us in some sort of way, in the same blood belongs to us, as, as, as though saying the actual business of blood, of having blood, comes from somewhere unnatural or cultural rather than physical or actual, you know, from, I mean, from nature. Uh, okay, uh, the 10 minutes to go sign was just up, so I'm just going to ask if there are any questions. Mrs. Torben, um, I believe that you've made, uh, it's after reading your uh, interview that I, I learned that uh, Testament of Mary has also has been made into a play also in 2013. But there is so much of subtext in it, in the sense that the silence that you spoke about, especially when Mary... Uh, refuses to create the Jesus that wants to, that the others want to be created and therefore she's not tell, giving that information about what did she see or what did he say. How did you dramatize it? Or, uh, um, I just let me finish it. Uh, one is that. Second, Nilanjana, while I was reading The Wildings, the first uh, short story that came to my mind was Satyajit Ray's Kagam. Uh, the philo philosophical crow. Uh, can I? No, that, that's, that's a comment. And this was oh, the question. I, um, I wrote a play and a novel where the Virgin Mary speaks. And the idea behind it was that um, the novel has to be short enough that you can read it in one sitting, which uh, creates the illusion that she spoke only once and this is what she said. She didn't say it again. It was one evening, almost in one breath, where out of silence came speech and the speech broke glass in and then to try and get an actress to work with that idea that the audience has not heard this ever before, it has not been spoken before. And you're trying to get a power, so that, I mean, one of the reasons is that in, in the New Testament, we see Mary, but we do not hear her. And as, uh, we don't hear her very much. And therefore, to actually give her a voice was just a way of dealing with that silence or breaking it, or indeed, um, you know, playing with it, actually just seeing what you can do with silence when you build voice. I think this is one of the most wonderful sessions I've heard so far. You've really given a deep insight. See, I'm a playwright and a script writer. Suddenly an urge of writing a book has come into me. <laughs> I don't know whether I should go there. See, I came backwards, okay. I've uh, always seen uh, films based on this great novel or this bestseller. I've, I've not read or heard anything the other way, okay. Now, would you advise me to stick to what I am, uh, improve my quality, or should I also uh, uh, encourage my urge of writing a book. I suppose the thing I would say is that, you know, if you start it, please finish it, because halfway through you'll realize something that you didn't know at the beginning, and you must go on then. That's the point at which you will start working well. Don't stop halfway. I mean, would it improve going. my script writing as well? Yeah, well, that too. Thank you. I think the... Um the single thing that you need to do as a writer that's going to improve your writing every day is to go out into the public space with a notebook and just pay attention to what you see and, uh, and what you hear, really. Um, also, um, I'm a great um, believer in going on to the next thing, really. Once you've made something as good as you possibly can, um, just... Uh, go on to the next thing. Don't dwell on something that isn't working indefinitely. Any other question? Uh, ma'am, you said that, yeah, ma'am, you said that uh, fantasy uh, should have some kind of ties to reality. Uh, so do you mean in terms of setting? Like, uh, for example, we've had books like Game of Thrones, we've had books like um, Lord of the Rings set in completely different realms, but still resonating with the audience. Uh, do you mean in terms of setting or can it be just with basic emotions itself? I think that's a very good question because it has to have a reality that isn't necessarily moored in the physical world or in physical time. But you know it when you see it. I, that, that is something that goes with great world building, whether it's Neil Gaiman doing it 
or whether it's something like the left hand of darkness. These are set in imaginary worlds. But your imaginary world has to have, um, the air has to have a smell about it, a scent that you recognize, you know? And uh, the two books that you cited are favorites because they do that precisely. They make you believe that somewhere, if you step out of your house and you turn the right way, you might actually walk into Westeros in the Game of Thrones. So it's a, mix of, it's a mixture of both. It does not have to be anchored in a real country or a real time at all. It just has to feel as real as though it was a real place. That's all. Most of the short story writers used to put their personal experience into stories and uh, uh, experience with the 20% personal experience and add up with the 80% of imaginary. What is your experience? Most of the short stories are based upon personal experience, as per my conclusions. There is, there is a wonderful quote from Jeff Dyer, which says that he writes only an inch from life, but all the art is in that inch. And I think that should be a good mantra for us, you know? Okay. Uh, I have one question. Uh, just Nilanjana wants to comment on that. Just give I just want to yeah. say about the thing of writing from real life, I have never been a cat and I don't intend to, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun imagining what a cat would be like. I'm yes, bored so by my own life. I don't want to read a book about a middle-aged novelist living in <laughs> South London. I I don't know, I think you run out of stuff in your own life, really. Um, yeah, I think there's, uh, I think you can start, I think you can start by talking about your, your own life, but um, after a bit you have to throw yourself into other people's lives. Absolutely, last question. Yep. Uh, when I started writing my book, uh, I didn't really care about what journal it was, I just started writing. Um, it was, uh, I, I thought it would be like uh, some Indians going and uh, 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 trying to win uh, in the TT game in China. And uh, it was a young adult. And then it, there was some romance and all that. Then there was some adventure and uh, other things. And then there's politics. Uh, between India and China, there's necessarily some politics there. So it trans, uh, kind of transferred um, uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, journal. Uh, would that actually make sense uh, for a new writer and will, uh, will it appeal to uh, the publishers? You've been a publisher, Nilanjana. Did you enjoy writing it? Because then I suppose that's all that matters really, you know? Yeah. I really enjoyed writing it. I just completed that and I'm looking for some kind of uh, uh, this one. But uh, every time there is a question, what, what kind of journal is it? Um, I'm not able to say, uh, I'm not able to fix it in any particular journal. Just say that it made me happy to write this genre and leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll wrap it up here. Amitabh needs a smoke. I guess the rest of us need to have lunch. Uh, can you just give these fine people a round of applause, please? Thank you very much. <laughs>